I come from California, from Temple City. How's that? Temple City, California. We had a mascot, the ram. So I'm a Temple City ram coming to Prophet Street in Jerusalem on March 6th, 2018. It's so wonderful to be in Jerusalem. I have one of four children in Jerusalem, two families up in Haifa. I live in Haifa. And I came to Israel 40 years ago. I never dreamed that I would be standing here now in a library. This is an amazing library, 8,000 books, Kaspari Center. This is called the Jewish Kaspari Center for Jewish Studies. No, no, excuse me. Biblical and Jewish Studies. And I love it because when I was growing up in California, I'll tell you, from, I'll tell you this from the beginning. Um, I grew up in an evangelical home. Um, I was very privileged to have such a rich background in Bible and all. And um, early on, I realized there were things within so-called Christianity that bothered me. And so what I was in fact doing was I was seeking to know the Jewish roots of my faith. And in high school already, I was sitting at the kitchen table five in the morning, six in the morning, my mother came and said, why are you up so early? You're going to endanger your health. And I said, I want God to use me. And I never would have dreamed that the call would be Israel because I was working with Spanish-speaking immigrants. Big word now, right? Spanish-speaking immigrants in the Los Angeles area. I don't want to get too carried away. I don't have a doctor before my name. I don't have letters after my name. So I'm privileged to be here that people believed in me and invited me. And I think that this book has a lot that we need to know that I never knew until one month after going to pension at age 66. I thought, why never, nobody ever taught me that. So that's our aim this evening to take a look at, at this book, which is the second most important source next to our Bible for us to know, because this is a history from the very beginning of time. This is the book. Uh, from the beginnings, it starts at creation and it goes all the way to the first century when Josephus Flavius lived. Now, if you were to ask me from the beginning, well, can we believe this? Is this true? For me personally, 98%, and I'll discuss the 2% at the end of the lecture. The inspired word of God, we don't change it only a person that would want a curse on his life would change one jit, jot or tittle, the Bible says. That's like the yud, the letter yud in the Hebrew language. It's like an apostrophe. Of course we don't change anything in the Bible. We, it's, 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 it's the, I, I have no words to express. I, I grew up with it from a childhood. I've read it many, many times, but Josephus has some very amazing things, which, which I'll tell you now. This is the way the original looked that um, was translated by Whiston from Greek to English in uh, the 1700s. And I put it in simple English. You can, uh, the average English speaker can read it in four or five hours. And uh, I got the essence of it. Every single book, there's 20 books, and every single section I, I made it simple to understand. Uh, Josephus Flavius. He was born, Joseph ben Matitiao. He was born in Jerusalem around 37 AD. And the second half of his life, he already took on the name, the, the Roman name. Uh, he was part of the Flavius family and he could write antiquities in Rome. This is an incident. Uh, he was involved in a lot of warfare. He had many, many thousands of troops. And this is, a, this is the only gory picture that you'll see, I promise. <laughs> uh, this this uh, picture, all of the pictures that I had my artists do, when I was thumbing through the different versions, 
when I was thumbing through the different versions of Josephus, I never saw these particular pictures. These were the pictures, despite being so, so very difficult to do it. Uh, and my, my artist, Mark, that lives in Texas, he had nothing to go on. We only knew that the Romans had cages, which they were putting over the, um, over the cliffs. And the soldiers were reaching inside and killing the people with those, those swords. And uh, this shows the people falling down to their deaths because rather than be captured by the Romans, a certain family had seven children and he just threw them down one by one to their death. And then the man and wife both committed suicide. Um, I need to mention, I, I, I'm going ahead of myself because I should say that Josephus was very, very wise. And even at the age of 14, he was able to answer questions from, from el of elders because he knew the Torah very well. The Hashemonaim, this was the priestly line, and they were so very learned and, and, um, and they were wealthy also. And, but at age 16, he went to the desert and he lived with the hermit. And he became acquainted with both the Essenes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And after those three years, he came back to Jerusalem and he was a Pharisee then. There were, there were for some reason, there were uh, priests that were in, in Rome and he went to Rome to bring them back. He succeeded. Then we had this picture. So I'm sorry that I got the order wrong. This is when he was in his 60s. Uh, this is the timeline. It's uh, simple. And if these dates here in Genesis, they, they can vary, vary by 200 years. So be aware of that. There's so many discrepancies about years. So I just chose the one that seemed to be the most prominent. All of these he discusses. Now, what I've done today, because this is just massive. So here I have the note about dates from Genesis can vary up to 200 years. The subject is just massive. So what I've done is I've taken the things that were like hidden treasures for me. This was the first thing that was just an aha moment. It was, it was just so, I thought, why didn't anybody teach me this? In all the years that I did Bible school, history, Alexander the Great and the high priest both had a dream or a vision Alexander's dream was he saw the high priest decorated in the, in the clothes that, that he would have worn on, on actually on Yom Kippur. He saw this like in a vision and he saw all of the, all of the Kohanim, the priests in their white clothing. And at the same time, God gave the vision to Jadua, the high priest, or spoke to him and said, don't fear Alexander the Great. Of course, he had every reason to fear him because he'd already, you know, Alexander the Great, everybody knows, the leopard. <laughs> Did you know that a leopard, leopard jumps six meters and three meters high and it would be running along with a car in our days. That's how fast they were. And so like this man, you know, if you look at a globe, he had already conquered half the, you know, from east to west. So here he is, now he's coming to Jerusalem. And Jadua prayed, but they had a peaceful meeting, which was so amazing. And they bring him inside, uh, probably into like a court of the temple. They show him the Daniel scroll. Isn't that amazing? I just found that so amazing. Lama, why did I ever hear of that before? The Daniel scroll, and they point and they say, here it says a Macedonian will defeat the Persian Empire. Do you think you're the man? And he said, I'm, I'm the man. So I just found this so amazing. And there was peace. The reason why I think this is true is because there was peace for another 270 years. So, 98%, I say, that's true. Um, the author Max Dumont that wrote uh, Jews, God, and History he said, legend has it that, well, anyway, people can check these things out. The next picture, 
is um, it has to do with Caius, Caius Caligula, this terrible, insane uh, leader back in Rome. He thought himself as a god. He had a difficult childhood. I really kind of don't blame him. He was one of six children. At one time, um, his mother, he was like seven years old, and his mother said something that wasn't politically correct at all to Tiberius. The whole family was killed. Five of the children, his mother and father, he was the only survivor. So since he was an orphan, he went to live in Capri with somebody. And as he was growing up, he, he was able to develop some leadership, enough ability that he eventually became the number one. And for the first six months, he was fine. Uh, but after those six months, he turned insane, maybe because he was poisoned. But um, it's very sad what he, what he had a terrible reputation of course, then they had all kinds of gods. They had Mercury, Jupiter, Apollos, Hercules. Each one had a different outfit. So this uh, Caligula would get up in the morning and decide, oh, today I'm going to be Mercury and put on that outfit. But what he did was he commissioned uh, to have his statue. This is his statue. And he had, a, he had it commissioned. And that was supposed to be put in the temple in Jerusalem. And I would assume that it would be coming all the way from Rome over, over land to Jerusalem. Well, the Jewish people uh, found out that he was coming and what he intended to do. And they held a huge protest, thousands and thousands of people in the area of Tiberias. And they said, no way. They put out this, oh, just kill us. And he saw all these thousands and thousands of people protesting. And he thought twice, because if all these people are dead, there's no taxes no taxes going to Rome. They'd left their crops, a whole month of demonstrations. So he thought, I will write, I'll write a letter back to them in Rome and saying it's a shame, really. And the moment he decided that, there was rain. There hadn't been rain in more than a year in Israel at that time. It was a terrible drought. And God showed the people uh, no, yeah, God showed Petronius that he was on the side of his people. He was blessing them greatly by sending this rain and, and that Petronius made the right decision. Now, I should just mention that the word Caligula means uh, little boot. When, when he was two and three years old, he was, you know, with all these Roman soldiers, they made him a little soldier suit. They thought he was so cute. And he had the little boot. Now, it's not like an IDF boot. It's more like a summer sandal. But that's the word Caligula is, is that so <laughs> from the sandal. The one you have written here is Caius. Is it Petronius? Or Caius. Caius. Caius is Caligula. I'm sorry. I forgot to put it in the parentheses. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, we have four branches of shoe stores in this country. Uh, called Caligula, and when I saw it in the Haifa Mall, I probably talked to the manager. I don't know. They're not there anymore. They're in uh, four other places, so whatever that's worth. Um, okay, now if the next picture, I don't, have, um, I don't have a picture of this story, but this story is um, Queen Helena lived in Adi Abin, um, which is now in Iraq, and Queen... Uh, Queen Helena was married to the king, who had more than one wife, but by, uh, by this man, uh, the king's name I forgot, she had an older son, and then she had Izates. And Izates was like, he had, a, he had a destiny, and he was like special, but she was afraid that the other children would tease him and bother him, and so she had him taken to uh, an, a kin where he was raised, and this Izatis was successful in life, married. He was given the land where there were relics from the Noah's Ark. And uh, they both came to Judaism separately. They were taught Judaism. They became Jews. And he eventually we went to visit his mother where she was. And she said, I want to go to Jerusalem. He said, fine, I'll go with you part way. He financed it. And they get to Jerusalem, and, and the people in Jerusalem are starving. 
This is from 50 to 56 AD. And this is the same time that the Apostle Paul, remember the poor people in Jerusalem, it was the same uh, starvation time. And she sent some attendants to Egypt to, buy, to bring uh, corn. She sent uh, to, to Cyprus, they brought uh, dried figs and she saved the city. Now another miracle, I just only need to mention it because of the time period but that's so this, the. So this is in Constantine's mother then. It's a different queen, Helena. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll answer you all questions later. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I can't be interrupted because I have so much to share okay, that. Anyways, we don't know but later, okay, later we'll we'll get to the we'll sort things out later, please, because this is being recorded and I'm I'm trying to get in a lot of information in in this hour. So. Um, Okay, the Hanukkah miracle, we all know this, that the, eight, the, uh, the oil lasted for eight days, the cleansing of the temple by, by the Hashmonaim. So I don't need to, and that's mostly in, Maccabi, in the Maccabees, in the Apocrypha. Actually, it's not in, in my book. And, but what I'm trying to say here, how I need to summarize this, is that we were taught always that there were 400 silent years between Old Testament and New Testament. I'm sure you agree that we were taught that way. But let's look at what I've just said. The first miracle, we had God speaking. Oh, and there were no prophets. Okay, that's, that's important to say that. It's true. There weren't prophets. But God spoke through the dreams and the visions, both to Alexander the Great and the great high priest. The second miracle was the rain miracle. So he was speaking through nature. The third miracle was the fact that these people... And I should say that Queen Helena was pregnant with these two boys by her brother. He was the brother. And maybe this is the reason why uh, here we have the essentials of Josephus by, by Paul Meyer. He's 88 years old. He is the absolute um, expert on, there's no, no more learned person than, than Paul Meyer on Josephus, but he doesn't include this, maybe because you know, this is incest, terrible, but they, God did use them. God did use her, I should say, and uh, to, save, to save many people's lives in Jerusalem at that time in, in uh, the first century. <clears throat> now I'm jumping up to Babylon, and in Babylon uh, we had Darius. One night he couldn't sleep. Are we surprised? <laughs> They lacked nothing, those kings. It was a very fertile area, good weather. He was with his three bodyguards. And in this evening, he's telling them, I, I'm, I'm thinking things over. He was like philosophizing. Which is stronger, wine, the king, women, or truth? Think about it overnight and come to me in the morning. So they thought about it overnight. And the first one, he says, I hope they slept enough. The first one says, I think wine is the strongest because wine fools the mind. The king thinks he's an orphan. The poor man thinks he's rich. The slave thinks he's free. So it must be that that is, the, oh, and the man goes home, uh, forgets his family. And when he does finally get home, he fights with them. And by the morning, he, re he remembers nothing. Mm -hmm. So wine must be the strongest. The second one says, no, no. I, I think that uh, the king is the strongest because the king does everything. He takes from the land. He takes from the sea all for himself. He sends his soldiers to fight no matter how much danger it is. He sends other soldiers to tear down mountains, to tear down towers and walls. The king is taking produce from the hard-working people. He has to get a percentage of the, the produce, and yet those, he knows, the, the people know well that he lacks nothing and he has all the entertainment he wants, and there's somebody watching the king at all times. That's all they do. Now the third bodyguard speaks up, and he says, women. Women is the strongest. Women bring, the, bring us into the world. The men give us our clothing. 
The men, uh, I mean, excuse me, the women make, do everything. For, they give us our clothing. They, uh, they raise the men that plant the vines and give us our wine. The women give us, uh, oh, a, ma a man will travel all the way across the world and, and over the sea and bring back spoils for a woman. A man will leave his family, leave his location, anything for a woman. Once he says, I saw a concubine with the king. She slapped him in the face. She took the crown, she put it on her own head, and she said, um, and he, he smiled and she smiled, and when she was angry, he was sad. He allowed himself to be disgraced by this woman. So that must be the strongest. But then he continued on, but no, truth is the strongest. Because God is faithful and true and just and no evil person can do anything against him. Whatever he plans will be done. Truth stands forever. It doesn't get old like, like uh, aging. It does and, um, and uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not stolen like jewels. So that was Zerubbabel. And the king was so pleased, he said, Zerubbabel, you are part of my family. Whatever you need to do, I will finance you. And he said, I need to get to Jerusalem. I need to take people. We need to build the temple. It says here in the prophet that we need to go. It's been 70 years already. We need to go. And he took 42,462 people back to Jerusalem. Now, this would have been a lot of money, and it took them about five months to get there. They needed to have their provision. They had to have the animals. The Bible gives us how many camels, how many horses, how many of all the different kind of animals, how many people. Their names are in the book of, of uh, Ezra, which is amazing. Uh, Ezra's list of people, I don't think it's uh, such a good idea to choose baby names from those, but it shows that God was so interested in every single individual. And we have the families. I just find it so amazing and how believable, how they kept the records. And of course, we know the Essenes and how they just copied and copied and they wrote the scripture for us, for the whole wide world. And there they were, you know, hardly eating. They, they had a very disciplined lifestyle. And I just appreciate these books and I don't mind all those names. In fact, I, I've studied the, the uh, genealogy of Yeshua and I have information that I can send you on that if you want to follow through. I did it years ago. It's a great, great study, in my opinion, because uh, it was the line, the city uh, of, of David. It was David's line up to when uh, the Messiah Yeshua was born. I say Yeshua, just, you know, I mean Jesus, but I'll use always the uh, Hebrew word because it's just so a part of me. So that was a rubbable. And the last, last verse in the book of Haggai, God says, Zerubbabel, you are my signet ring. The signet ring, uh, this ring is, uh, I mean, this, um, this is actually Hezekiah, but I just wanted to show you they're so small. And now in the last month, maybe the last two weeks, Dr. Elat Mazar has discovered the Isaiah Bula. The bula is a stamp from the ring, right? And she says there's one letter missing, but I'm sure it's Isaiah. I'm sure that, that God is allowing a wake up. This is true. This is the city. This is where he was. This is the history. You know, just like when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it was so amazing. It changed uh, people's thinking a lot about the Bible. Um, I'll show you the picture of this is Moses um, with his army and how he met his uh, black wife. The black people, they come either from the union of Tharbis. He gives us her name. 
Tharbas and Moses, or they come, of course, from the union of uh, Queen of Sheba and Solomon. But I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to go into this because I want you to buy my book. I want to leave you something that you'll be curious and want to buy my book. <laughs> I will move on. Uh, this is another one also. I don't have the time to talk about the sons. Herod, of course, he was very, very uh, cruel to his family and to anybody who criticized him. He just, in a minute, he would kill people for not good reasons. That's Herod there on the right. Uh, oh, I finished all the pictures. Okay, this um, this we can. Okay, let me go to Uzziah. Uzziah is a marker in the Bible. How's my time going? Oh, okay. Uzziah is a is a time marker. We all know Isaiah six. In the year that Uzziah dies, I saw the Lord. You know the train of the temple. And um, also in the couple of the minor prophets, first chapter, first verse, you know, Uzziah is mentioned. And um, I, Uzziah, if we put him uh, together with all of the prime ministers of Israel in the last 70 years, um, and we would have people vote, you know, who is the best, Uzziah would come way up at the top. He had territory all the way down to Egypt. He was digging wells. They had lots of water, lots of agriculture. He himself loved agriculture. He loved to see the, all the greenery and all. And uh, he was a great builder, and he had built all kinds of towers. And for that time, he had the equivalent of the Iron Dome. They felt very protected. And Uzziah, in one day, he overstepped. He did something that was not on his... Uh, list of things he was supposed to do. The, te the temple cracked and there was a ray of the sun that came on his face and he had leprosy. And of course, all of the priests were in a total panic and they put him out of the city. And just because of that act of disobedience to God, he didn't have, when he died, he didn't have a, a usual burial that he would have deserved a, a tremendous burial, but they just put him in his own gardens in contrast, Herod, as bad as he was, he had an enormous funeral procession and his, his casket, it was gold and jewels and all, and they walked for 25 days to get to Herodian. <clears throat> and I'm mentioning Herodian because there was uh, Dr. Ehud Netzer of the Hebrew University he had a team and they were digging in, uh, on the Herodian, it's this big elevated mountain just like Masada and from all of the information that we have in Josephus all of the measurements which are specific he went with his group and um, they had a railing there you know they're digging down there was a railing and he leaned on the railing and he tragically fell to his death very shortly before they actually found the tomb of Herod. And then we have David's tomb. Uh, both Herod's tomb and David's tomb had been pillaged. They'd stolen things, and then they went back a second time. I think it was David's, uh, it was either David or Herod's tomb that the second time they went to steal what was inside, there was a flame that leaped out. And then they, uh, they left it alone after that, and they actually had like a stone as a memorial of that occasion, they, they put that stone there. So maybe one day we'll find, find that stone. Some scholars think that the second tomb that Professor Nasser found is not It's controversial. Oh, okay. So thank you. We'll, we'll talk at the end of uh, when I get through with everything. Thank you for bringing it up. We'll, we'll come back to that, I promise. Okay, Mount... Mount Gerizim. I didn't know, but the uh, Mount Gerizim is the highest mountain in Samaria. And when they were, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping from one period of time to another, but that's the only way I can bring out things that I felt were important, that when the Jewish people in, in uh, Jerusalem were being killed, the ones in Samaria heard about it, and uh, they didn't want to be slaughtered so they wrote to Rome and they said we do not have a temple in 
Gerizim anymore. Well, no, sorry. They changed the name to Jupiter and they said, we're, we're, we're Hellenists. So that was it. They didn't uh, want to identify anymore with the Jewish people. And in Rome, they said, fine, that's all right. We go with that. Uh, then on a, on a later occasion, this is in Joseph, you have the section number, you have the book number there in, on your uh, handout. So there was a showdown that um, they were going to decide which is the valid temple, either Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem. And guess who won? Of course, Jerusalem, but oh, but what was the argument? Um, this was Ptolemy was officiating that. The losers would be killed. Um, okay, they said Jerusalem has to be it because Aaron was the first priest. Then it was succeeding. It was the succeeding generations. And so we're the true temple, right? And, and not only that, as the Magi came. Isn't that amazing? The Magi's gifts to Jerusalem. That tells you something, doesn't it? Okay, um, I'll get back to the Magi later on. Small pearls I want to share with you. Gedalia. Gedalia was left behind with the 10% of people that weren't exiled to Babylon, and he was watching over mostly uh, the agriculturalists because they, here again, the taxes, the Romans with their taxes, right? He would be responsible to pass on the taxes. And there was, uh, Jeremiah was with him, and Baruch. So there was a fellow that came by by the name of Ishmael. And uh, the people said, watch out for this Ishmael. I don't have a good feeling about him. And uh, Gedalia said, oh, I'm being kind to him, so I wouldn't worry. And he was gone. After one month, he came back. They were partying. They were all getting drunk. Josephus writes that Gedalia was, was cruelly murdered by this Ishmael. In a, he was drunk and sleeping. Then there was another group coming to give some gifts to Gedalia and his group, and they were also killed. Joseph. We don't know from our Bible that Joseph, uh, about his wisdom when they were collecting for the seven seven years of famine. Of course, the Pharaoh knew, but it was very wisely kept under wraps that there would be a seven-year famine. They were collecting, collecting, storing away all that corn. But uh, Josephus, I noticed that that was interesting, that the people didn't know. The Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was being built with bitumen. Bitumen is waterproof. So this shows that the people were even more defiant because they didn't believe the promise, which obviously Noah had told the people, this is the sign, the rainbow, God will never again flood the earth. But they didn't believe it, so they were in their stubbornness, building with bricks and bitumen. Noah's dove. Noah sent out the raven, then he sent out the dove. The dove came with the olive branch. But Josephus writes that it was covered with mud. Now, if it was in the Dead Sea, it would be black mud, right? So I think we need to upgrade our peace symbol for the Middle East. So this will be a challenge for somebody. I'd like to see the tourists coming into the little shops in the old city. Excuse me, do you have the Josephus uh, version of the white dove? Okay, um, Jewish people that I've talked to have told me that there are rabbis that say not to read Josephus. This is very unfortunate. So there are in the entire book, my, my book is more than 400 pages. There's only six sentences about Yeshua. Uh, Josephus was born after Yeshua ascended to heaven, which if we say it was like 34, it's debatable, maybe it's 30. And the things he says, okay, he like hints on Yeshua's uh, Elohut, I mean his uh, godliness, let's say. 
because he said uh, there was a man that did wonders if we can call him a man so that's like you know so that could be upsetting them it could be also that the incident with Daniel and of course they have the part about Daniel and the three uh, Hebrews in the fiery furnace and the part about Daniel in the lion's den uh, Daniel, I find in the country, from my experience, because I've been watching uh, in Hebrew, I've been watching the Bible contest on Independence Day, and they talk about all of the prophets and the questions, and Bibi Netanyahu is giving them these questions. Daniel is never mentioned, and this is tragic because actually Daniel is the number one. I want to show you the book that's. Uh, this is an amazing source, Sir Isaac Newton. Of course, he was a tremendous uh, one when it came to dating and all. This book is a little bit strange here and there, but I found out that, I mean, Daniel is just the key to everything else. It's, it's obvious to me. Of course, they're afraid of Daniel 9, and I'm not going to go into Daniel 9 uh, in detail because it's too much. <laughs> but actually, just days ago, when I'm reading about Daniel in my book, he comes to the end of the part. He mentions uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, and that's a good marker because others say that the thing about Daniel is that he prophesied what would happen to the Jewish people, which was tragic, tragic things in uh, the time of the Hashmonaim. First of all, he would change the times and laws. He would forbid the people, the people to sacrifice. He, he put a pig on their uh, altar in the temple. He would forbid the people to do circumcisions. He would even crucify those women. The children would be killed. It was just atrocious. But that's what we have in chapter 11 of Daniel. And the argument was how could Daniel know all of these things that happened in um, beforehand because he was writing in 600 uh, BC and how could these things during um, the time of Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth how could he how could he have known well of course he could have known because he was a prophet and apart from that Isaiah knew even the word Cyrus that not only would Cyrus be a ruler but it's like God downloaded the name which is which is so amazing I love Cyrus. You know why? Because he only has one name. <laughs> I, I mean, he's the only one. Because we have, uh, why I'm trying to condense and not go into too many details, because we have five Herods, three Alexanders, Hyrcanus, Stein, uh, two Aristobulus, three, uh, anyway, Xerxes, two, Darius. Uh, you know, it's, it's a puzzle. It takes a lot of time to, to draw out things, <laughs> at least for me anyway. So anyway, what happened is with Daniel, there was a man by the name of Porphyry. He lived in 265 AD, and he wrote 15 volumes against the new faith. Remember the faith of so-called Christianity, Constantine, and all? we're talking 300 something. But this Porphyry already, he was, he was making so many criticisms and uh, he was saying that Daniel was written in the time of the Hashmonaim because it was just, you know, and he was already dampening the word of God through Daniel. And somebody in the 4th century tried to burn all of his books for 440 A.D., but the damage was done already. It leaked out, and you know what? I was listening to the message by W.A. Criswell, many messages on Daniel, a huge series. You can buy the book. It's a, it's a big book because he had, first of all, he had the first book, second book, third book on Daniel. Then later he got, got it all together. And uh, I have it coming in the mail. And it's, it's amazing what he, he told about this porphyry. It was the first time I'd heard about it. And, um, well, there's other people that agree. This is, he, I think... Um, Newton agrees, but for sure, Roger Libby, a tremendous book through the eyes of the prophet, hard to get a hold of, but he is, he's saying everything has been fulfilled, just like Josephus said in the first century. Okay, so you say, well, there's the second meaning. There, okay, first meaning, second meaning, in the future. Um, but Falstich is also, he mentions por Porphyry here. 
History, Harmony, and Daniel, but I don't know if you can get a hold of this because I wrote to his son. This man is deceased, and I didn't get a let, uh, I didn't get a an answer yet. But I think that it's just wow. For me, when I read these things and I say, okay, there's so many eschat eschatological books. Maybe some of them need to be removed from the shelves. You know that uh, we had it in uh, Bible school when I was in California. Uh, working out the seven week, the 40, the this, years, weeks, woof, it was just phew. So I like found this as a relief in a way to hear, okay, it's been fulfilled. And t today, even lately, I've heard a sermon, the people in Jerusalem will go off to Petra, they'll be fine over there. Um, I don't know how they're supposed to walk from Jerusalem to Petra, but anyway, um, the people already left Jerusalem because Josephus, Ju Josephus writes that he took 800 people to Masada, but there wasn't room for another 9,000 had to go to Idumea. So that's a, and then there's another example. I don't have time to look it up. Another example where people were leaving Jerusalem to go east. So that's already taken place. Um, okay, I just want to... I want to say something about the Temple Mount. It's a whole subject that people could speak for hours on. In short, there's the two views. Either the Holy of Holies is under the, it's not the Alaska Mosque. The Alaska Mosque, as I understand it, is that gray one. The, the other one is called the Noble Sanctuary. And the Temple Mount Faithful, uh, Dr. Ridgemeyer, who wrote the quest, that's their view. Uh, the whole thing about uh, Ophel, the city of David. The important thing that I like to bring out here, there's all of those references are in your handout, by the way. I'm mentioning videos that you can watch. There's hours of videos on this subject. But what's important for me is to tell you what Josephus wrote. He wrote that uh, in speaking of Simon, the high priest, he broke down the fort in Jerusalem so that their enemies could no longer hide in it. He gathered the people and convinced them to work hard to tear down the entire mountain where the fort was. They worked day and night for three years and flattened the mountain so that the temple was now the highest of all the buildings. Now, I watched one video and it showed that they point and they say, well, that's Mount Zion, but it was leveled down. But if it was Mount Zion, what was on there? It wasn't a temple because he says that it was a fort there. So if they're re referring to that mountain, there was a fort. And uh, another, another one is uh, Archelaus. Archelaus. Together with his horsemen, he was ordered to kill all those inside and outside the city who tried to escape. At least 3,000 were killed while some escaped to the mountains. Archelaus sent the crowds home before the end of the festival. Um, there were, okay, there were two things that are missing. The, the, the model is wrong. I can understand that the model was wrong. That one that they're showing in many, many publications, the one that's uh, near the museum, it's wrong because they don't have these, these um, passageways. It's, we could call it like a bridge that's going over from the northwest part of the temple over to the San Antonio Fortress. Antonio Fort, not San, the Antonio Fortress where the Romans were. So if that is missing, the, the, that's something that, that's quite serious. Anyway, there's a lot of information, those who are interested. Uh, Micah 3.12, Zion will be f plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, the temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. So this has to be in the formula. And of course, it's so amazing. We have now the new tunnel. Before it was just Hezekiah's tunnel. You probably know about uh, Warren Shaft. The history is all very fascinating. I don't know if there's more than two tunnel tours at City of David. I know there's the Western Wall Tunnel, and I really recommend uh, tours in these places. It's, if there's more than two tunnels in um, 
in the city of David. Now they say the second one, which they've cleaned out more recently, it, it water, but I'm thinking, well, maybe that was the refuse. Uh, you need to remember that the Gihon was a gusher. If anybody's been to Yellowstone, every hour on the hour without the heat, but we had this gusher of water going up as high as 400 feet. Otherwise, there would be no, no Jerusalem because this was the only source of water. Then it would come down into the Siloam pool where 10,000 people had to be in the mikvah before they went to offer sacrifices at the temple. There's a lot of information. Um, sometimes when I've heard people speak, I think uh, that when they've given a little bit of personal information, actually it's, it's more of a blessing than, than just all this, because this you're going to get on your own. I just have to share that um, when I was at the Feast of Tabernacles one year, there was a man from Central America that was telling about the eagle. He said, the eagle goes high, high up on the cliff. And the first thing it has to do is to, to take the beak and, 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 and take the beak off because it's so old and crooked and can't eat anymore. And then after it grows back, then, it, then it's cleaning off all the feathers. And after the feathers are all cleaned off, which also takes a while, for the new ones to come in. And then it flies high, 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 like test pilot. And then this is a renewal of the eagle. And I sat there, and I was just crying through the whole message. And I thought, well, this is my eagle year. My husband had a, an abominable operation that was very, it was like a cavern. It was, it was a very hard year for us. But lately, people are saying, no, it's not that. It's, it's not. It's not right. This is, this is a, something people made that up. They say uh, eagle can live to be 50 or 90. It all depends on if they're going to suffer, self-imposed suffering. And now they're saying uh, the latest I saw on Facebook was that the wind, they go up, and then there's the wind, and the wind will blow away all the bad feathers, and then they can. So I really don't know. So I hope that somebody will write to me. This has been up here for a long, long time. <laughs> So write to me, because really I want answers to this. I want answers to know if this is really what God intends for us. See, the man from Central America, maybe the eagle has a different habit there. Maybe somebody really saw this beak thing happening, and I, and I want to know. Um, truth. We're in a world of fools, excuse me, but, but David said it. Psalm 46. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. It's getting down to the wire, folks. I really think that it's very, very serious. Just in the last few days, I've thought about Esther, and I've thought about Mordechai, and I've thought about Haman. Mm -hmm. Haman is back. Haman is back, and he's the same. All the Jews, all the Jews, you know? And there's Esther, that's Israel. I'm Mordechai. I don't know. Esther is the Jews. Esther is Israel. And I'm Mordechai. And Israel, or like the Jews are saying, don't embarrass us. You're sitting there. You're putting dirt on your face. You're not taking a bath. You're not, Here, take these clothes. Don't be that way. You're embarrassing us. But I think really seriously that Esther has to stand up and to do the job, that Israel has to stand up and do the job. And I'll tell you what I mean. When I was reading the Odyssey of Homer for the first time, I got to the second half of the book, and a woman becomes a butterfly. This is mythology, long, long buried. We don't deal with it. It's not taught anymore. Who buy? My husband probably picked up the book for free. I want to tell you about more mythology, and we need to be frightened. I'm going to bring Nehemiah. Nehemiah, come on, because I, I have to stick with my subject as Josephus. Okay, Nehemiah, take a look. We've got a couple of hoof prints here on the Temple Mount. This horse had the face of an angel and the wings of a peacock. Here's the hoof prints. What do you say? Oh, in the book. They have the book. 
I've thumbed through, I went to the index and I looked for Jerusalem and I didn't find it. What do you think? Nehemiah, do you, no portion? Before you also said no portion. Yeah, 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 yeah. You get my point. I think we have to stand up to mythology. Personally, I think it's very, very critical. Who can believe it? Who can believe in mythology? 600 years later, two-thirds of the pie is the Jewish people of, in, in Jerusalem. A third is the Christians because they came only about 2,000 years later. There's no more room. There's no room for mythology. I'm sorry. Abu Mazen, this morning, he's 83. He exercises twice a day. I'm concerned about the body of Christ. If we're not in shape, this is our temple. This is my temple. I tell people if I wasn't at the sports center or doing what I'm doing, I might as well put a foot in the grave. I'm the exact age now as Golda Meir when she became prime minister. 71. It's the grace of God. I had a goal. Not to be, God forbid, prime minister, but to get my book going. And God blessed me. And when I was 70, it finally got onto Amazon. It's been on there for a year. I need your help. I don't have any more financing. I have books in the other room if you'd like to buy. And I have receipts for you. And uh, I want people that are in the hearing of my voice. The, it's available in about 10 countries apart from Israel, but the, the pictures are not in color. I'm sorry about that. The e-book version is doing well. It's in color. There was no change with that except for a couple of, um, a couple of uh, there were some typos. I, I did change some typing errors. And uh, so the book, yeah, up to now, thank God he supplied all of my needs, friends from a long time back, and even friends lately. But, but I need to print uh, the colored ones. I need uh, to print a, a minimum of 100, and uh, I can't do that. Once these books are gone, I have less than probably 30, and they're in an, on consignment around the country a bit, then I won't be able to print another 100. And if people want color, they have to get it from me because the uh, versions that are going out around the world, it's black and white. That's, that's the only way they work. Uh, okay, Sephoris. Sephoris was the largest, I'm, this, this is not connected, but I did want to mention that Sephoris was the center in the Galilee region. It was, it was huge. Um, I think Mary was from Sephoris. People would come from Nazareth and work in Sephoris. It's the mosaic capital of Israel, and that is where Josephus was fighting, also in um, Tiberias. Those two, those two particular places were mentioned a lot in Josephus. Um, okay, there's so much, but what you can do is I will just show you what I have here. And um, those of you that are watching on the video, if you write to me, you can get the notes. There's the four pages of notes from the lecture. And I'd be happy to send them, and that will give you many, many, um, many video links, and also um, which book and which section uh, some of the subjects were. Okay, this is something also. This is uh, the genealogy of Yeshua, that all the references. This is from Dr. Mary Lou Harris, Dr. Futterer, from 1912 to 40, but it's, uh, it's basically the same. And in One for Israel, they had this on their site for a long time. And actually, when you type my name on, in, in, um, on the internet, this would come up, but now it's disappeared. This is my comments on the genealogy of Yeshua. It's, it's an amazing study when you just think about it. Even Abraham, the father of us all, he was a warrior. Who knows? Somebody in the 1400s, if you look in Wikipedia, it has a picture of him with a soldier you know, uniform on. But he could have been he could have kill, been killed so easily. You know, he wiped out the king of Og. He wiped out the king of Sihon. Mel, 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 he came and gave the you know Melchizedek, and so this is information. Um, Sukkot. 
there's a difference of opinion. Was he born at Sukkot or was he born, uh, you know, Jonathan Kahn, very famous, thinks it's Pesach. These are things that I can give you my information. It needs to be studied. Now I'm going to say something to offend all of the Nazarenes. Uh, the Nazarenes in the Bible were John the Baptist and Samson. Yeshua was a wine-bibber, but because when they translated from the Greek, they put a Z in there, Nazareth, and it should have been a tzaddik, either T-Z or T-S. And this is a study that Dr. Bargill Pixner uh, of blessed memory, I have all this here. And also I went to the library and I got the archaeological uh, encyclopedia. And it's the same thing that they found on a, what do we call it? It's a piece of clay. They saw the, the names of all of the priestly families. And the word Na Nazareth is with a tzaddik. We need to come to the truth. You know, I'm happy to be here because this is um, a place where they're interested in truth and Jewish roots and fixing. Hopefully, we'll fix things. There's so much that needs to be fixed, both on the side of the Jewish people and the Christians. The Jewish people, I wish, if I had my wish, they would change back like the Bible. The first month is Nisan, right? And also, the genealogy should be from the man. That'll make people upset, but you know what? And I think God has a sense of humor because the New Testament, what's the first thing you look at? Matthew 1.1, 1, 1. the genealogy of Messiah. Poof, blows me away. How could it be more in the face? And the Zerubbabel is there, my favorite. Oh, wow, he's actually Daniel. He's next to Yeshua, the most amazing person in the whole wide world. Why? Because God downloaded, he had such intimacy with God. God called him Ahuv, the beloved. And he could say what the dream was, which nobody else could do at that time. Joseph interpreted it, but he didn't know the dream itself. Of course it wasn't fair, and all, the, uh, all of those astrologers would have died. But God kept them alive because of Daniel. He prayed and downloaded what the dream was. And those astrologers, another 500 years down, they all went to the best, you know, University of Babylon. How did they find the Messiah in Jerusalem? And they found him on time. They found him in Bethlehem, excuse me. But you see, they had to come on time because Herod was going to kill all the children under two. So the timing was perfect, and that was the... Astro astronomy, no, uh, astrology, no. Stay away from that. So then why is there so much astrology in the kibbutzim? Why was there a, two golden calves in Dan and, and, and uh, you know, Bethel? It's, uh, you know. And I have also, uh, Daniel wrote that he would be cut off in the middle of the week, right? The Messiah, that there would be no sa more sacrifices. To me, it's simple. That was Yeshua. They were offering the sacrifices at the same time. Uh, Yeshua was crucified at the same time they were offering those sacrifices. And the veil of the temple, by the way, was this wide. And it came down. The tear came all the way down. So it had to be from heaven. So I think personally that he was crucified on either the Wednesday or the Thursday. And here's some information that I can send you. Uh, because... The way it got mixed up was because there was the word high Sabbath, the women coming, you know, the high Sabbath. That's a marker. That says something. But the people think, oh, Sabbath, Sabbath. There's the Sabbath of Pesach, of the holidays, the first and last of the holiday of, of Passover, the first and last days of Sukkot. This is the high Sabbath. Now I need to conclude because I've taken one hour, and I thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. <laughs>